Hi everyone, I think we can probably make a start. So I'm very happy to welcome you all to this final session in the Osmos webinar series. Uh, I'm Thomas from RTE and together with Judita from NCL and Sven and Florian from UDE, we'll be giving you a broad overview of the research we carried out in work package two of the Osmos project, which focused on market design modeling and analysis for flexibility. We'll be presenting for about 40 to 45 minutes, and then we'll take your questions during the final 15 to 20. Before getting into the core of today's presentation, just a few brief words about the Osmos project. It was funded by the EU and started in January 2018, gathering 33 different partners across nine different countries, ranging from transmission system operators to academia and manufacturers. There were two main objectives for the project. The first was to improve our understanding of future flexibility needs and sources, which was done by developing and applying new modeling methodologies. The second objective consisted in implementing large scale demonstrators. Today's presentation concerns work package two and will hence focus on the first of these two objectives. More spe specifically, if you happen to attend yesterday's seminar in Work Package 1, you will have seen that our partners proposed investment pathways leading to optimal combinations of flexibility solutions. The size of the problem they had to solve forced them to make many modeling assumptions. In Work Package 2, we used Work Package 1's investment pathways and try to refine some of these assumptions in order to evaluate the extent of their impact on the solution to the dispatch problem. For example, we went beyond Word Package 1's assumption of benevolent monopoly and perfect competition by modeling the behavior of individual agents in response to different sets of market rules. We also went beyond the assumption of perfect foresight by exposing these agents to short term uncertainty. Their decisions are based on a gradually receding fog of uncertainty around load and variable renewable generation. We also enhanced geographical granularity by considering nodal market frameworks and by looking at the interface between the transmission and the distribution systems. The increasingly distributed nature of flexibility solutions imposing a more detailed consideration of network constraints. The refined modeling approaches allowed us to explore different sets of market rules and make modeling recommendations to try and ensure that the right dispatch decisions are made at the right time that revenues cover asset costs and that appropriate investment signals are sent. All studies were carried out in parallel by the different partners, each using their own modeling frameworks. The different properties of each framework allowed us to consider different trade-offs between model scope and model precision, providing complementary insights on the short-term operation of the 2030 European power system with a specific focus on the impact of uncertainty on day ahead and intraday market outcomes. For example, UDE's models uh, GMM and CE grid, JMM and CE grid, grid allowed the consideration of a large temporal scope consisting of a full year. Using Prometheus and Atlas at RTE, we're able to consider market agent decision making as uncertainty is gradually revealed though the added complexity only allowed in the simulation of 24 hour periods. In CL study performed a spatial downscaling of one of RT studies, studying the TSO DSO interface. We'll now give the floor to Sven, who will describe one of these five studies in more detail. Um, thank you, Thomas. <clears throat> uh, if you could switch to the next slide. OK, uh, basically what we did, I mean, when, within our work package, we always refer to zonal and nodal studies here. The key takeaway is actually not that it's a zonal study. Uh, I guess it's something that is done very often. We've done it for the year 2030 for the European scope. But the key takeaway here is that we actually um, used updated information, namely wind forecasts. <laughs> like in real world, you start with a day ahead planning and you have a designated set of information that is updated throughout the day actually till maturity or realization. 
what we did, we took our um, European market model. It's marked with number two on the right side uh, and took advantage of its rolling planning approach. And thus, we also could start with an initial um, set of information and then um, gave updated information for the same target hours into the model and had a look um, what actually the model does, which uh, technologies, um, I mean, the updated information, of course, then contains a different realistic, but different wind forecast. And then we have a look what the model does, uh, considering technical constraints, which units could be still switched off and uh, uh, switched on, <laughs> and which are chosen actually at the end of the day uh, to provide flexibility. Um, the major, challenge we had to overcome here is actually not implementing it in the model, but data. And we um, build two tools that are actually here summarized as the forecast simulation tool, which I present you on the next slide. Uh, could you switch? Ah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, OK, basically, the issue we are having is not only finding a forecast that is realistic and updated, and of course, a data source that provides all that information, <coughs> which, spoiler alert, doesn't exist, uh, at least it's not publicly available. Um, so the best we could do is actually agree on, well, what should be the end of a forecast trajectory? The latest information, of course, should be the realization. So we need to find a forecast that fits um, to the realization time series. That is data source number one we're using. The second one is the update structure that we're actually saying, OK, there is new information coming in. And if two hours target hours are close to each other, for instance, by one or two hours, um, the impact this new information has on both hours is almost the same. It usually has the same sign if it's one or two hours. Uh, but if you go away, if it's six hours, eight hours, it will be almost a random movement. <clears throat> so within these updates, there's a temporal dependency structure that we um, um, uh, derived from one source. And then, of course, we still, if you want to do it at a European scope, there's also a link in space uh, that countries that lie next, next to each other. Um, if we simulate new information, the new information to lesser extent than with a temporal dimension, but also should affect if these countries are lying next to each other and so on. So basically what we did in our tool, shine, we had, uh, tool chain, we had a data imputation tool to first multiply the temporal and spatial dependencies and create one big correlation matrix. And then we went with this to an update simulation tool um, we updated the wrong way to end with the realization. We started with the realization and then um, um, basically uh, put information shocks or information updates into our model and it generated correlated um, trajectories. <laughs> Those wind updates then were added on the realization time series and all of a sudden we have a consistent um, uh, not only consistent realization time series, but also consistent uh, forecast time series that actually replicates how information is um, developing over time. Next slide, please. OK, basically what I explained earlier is here a simple example. Uh, on the left hand side, you can see, by the way, in, in both uh, um, uh, charts that are on the uh, upper half of the slides, the orange line, well, it should be actually the same. I hope it's the same. Uh, it should replicate how a forecast for 4 p.m. develops during one day. <coughs> and on the left hand side, you actually have um, also a forecast for 3 p.m. And on the right hand side, a forecast for 10 a.m. So on the left hand side, both trajectories are actually have a, let's say, temporal distance of one hour. So there's actually one or two, I always have to search for these uh, momentums, but one is from six to seven that the sign of the update isn't equal. Um, but other than that, there's still a second one, but I can't find it. <laughs> other than that, the, the movement of both trajectories, the development of knowledge is almost equal uh, because these hours are close to each other and an information update actually affects both almost in the same way. If you look on the right hand, uh, on the other hand, 
we have a temporal distance of six hours with 10 a.m. in green and 4 p.m. Um, in, in orange. And you can see sometimes they're moving in the same direction, but um, it's also fair to call it in a wider understanding, almost a random movement. <coughs> And um, the whole image of that is, of course, that if you would look at 10 a.m. and 11 a.m., both forecast trajectories, they would be behave like uh, you see it on the picture on the left, um, because then again, it's just one hour. So you receive a very complex temporal dependency structure that looks actually very neat. If you plot it, I did it below in the middle. <laughs> um, it is just... Um, uh, it translates basically as the closer two forecast trajectories are, the greater they share the impact of new information. And of course, with a spatial dimension that is uh, um, equally, but we didn't uh, uh, plot this here. If you go to the next slide, um, by the way, what you saw earlier is what we put into our model. Um, basically, the vertical part of it and said this is the knowledge at eight o'clock, this is the knowledge at nine o'clock, and then reiterated the uh, optimization problem of unit commitment. <clears throat> compared, here we compared the, the outcome actually, if we take a day ahead planning and then the latest available intraday planning, what has changed? This is basically what this slide shows. It's still split into negative and positive forecast updates for each country, you can see two bars. The left is always for negative um, forecast updates. That means there's less wind coming, uh, less wind realized than expected day ahead. And the right column is then more wind um, than expected on the day ahead part. And then we still split positive and negative sums. So it's uh, a bit more, well, it's not easier to read, but more interesting. Um, what you see, apart from gas units, and there's already an exception in, in Spain and France, um, it's usually a diverse mix of technologies that is responding. But if we focus um, on the right hand, say, right hand side of the figure for the UK, I highlighted here two bars. Um, the left one actually means there's negative forecast updates, so there's less wind coming than expected, and thus there is a surplus of conventional production. That seems right, first of all. If we look to the other one, we actually see that there's more wind coming and more production from uh, um, conventional units. So apparently there's something, you could say it's something wrong, but the point here is actually uh, that this highly indicates or almost proves that uh, flexibility provision for forecast updates in each country are not handled um, in each country, but it's actually um, a cross-border flexibility provision. And the larger, well, rather the smaller a system is, the bigger that impact, of course, is, specifically, specifically if there's a large uh, neighbor next to this country, um, then of course <coughs> you can hardly see a difference, for instance, with the Netherlands between uh, the positive and the negative um, response. Um, if we go to the next slide, there is still another open question. Uh, not only who provides flexibility, but uh, it's also worth comparing this flexibility um, to, uh, for instance, the overall share of production. Uh, this is what the, I'm sorry, a very complicated uh, figure on the right hand side is. The first column for each country always shows um, the share each technology has of overall production. So it just says, for instance, for Austria, that was 65% of hydro reservoirs uh, produced the electricity. That has nothing to do with flexibility at first. The second column is the share each technology has with positive flexibility provision. <clears throat> so that means there's energy missing from day ahead to intraday. And now the conventional units are contributing. And the third one uh, is then the opposite side. It's downward flexibility. And we can see, again, it's a diverse picture of technologies with one exception. Gas is always present. And the other one is actually uh, hydro. Uh, we can see that storage units are more likely to be spared 
because they usually just uh, use downward flexibility. They are not very likely to be used for, they are used, but to a small extent for positive flexibility because once from a hydro reservoir, if you take the water out, it's lost. So that's uh, an easy thought that you would spare it. And on the other hand, if you can do replace what was in your storage, for instance, with pumped hydro, you can see they usually just provide upward flexibility. So that was the very short um, part of what we understand as a zonal study and what we did to investigate who provides flexibility. And there is two uh, key takeaways that we're having here. One is flexibility provision is cross-border. There's no focus in national markets. And the second thing, um, the energy system takes advantage of not just one technology that does the job best, but uses a variety of technologies for uh, flexi flexibility provision and also a variety of or different variety of uh, technologies for up and downward flexibility provision. Thank you very much. And I think I'm heading over to Judita here, if I'm not mistaken. And it's back to me, sir. Thanks, Thanks a lot, you. Ben. Um, I'll now be covering some of the work uh, carried out by RTE, first, dis first discussing the specificities of our modelling approach and then providing a few results for our simulations. So the aim of our modelling approach, based on our model ATLAS, is to have a very accurate representation of the day ahead to real-time power system operation. Instead of having a central planner with perfect foresight, we consider individual agents and model the different steps in their decision-making process as uncertainty is gradually revealed. In the studies carried out in OSMOS, we consider two agents per node, one consumer and one generator. So based on day ahead forecasts of both load and renewable generation, uh, we used the same data that uh, Sven had just described earlier. We reused uh, their, their work effectively. Uh, so based on this information, we have our different market agents that can formulate buy and sell orders. These orders are then collected and cleared by a day ahead market which determines uh, the traded volumes, market prices, and whether each order is accepted or rejected. This information is sent back to the market agents, who can then redefine the way their engagements can be met using their whole asset portfolio. A similar process is then modeled in the intraday based on updated forecasts. Solving this succession of optimization problems is computa computationally intensive, but it can lead to significant changes in dispatch, which are hence uh, important to explore. For example, if we look at these, uh, uh, these results here, we show the evolution of the dispatch of Spanish uh, CCGT capacity over a 24 hour period. In red, we have the dispatch as seen in the day ahead, uh, both before and after the reoptimization of agent portfolio activations. When we move over to the intraday, however, it so happens that in this particular case, uh, the wind day ahead forecasts have been too optimistic, and gas unit units must be turned on as expressed by the green curve in full. The need for gas generation is then reduced when the Spanish generator agent is given a chance to re-optimize its portfolio as shown in the dashed green curve. So this is just to give you an illustration of the type of effects that our modeling approach is able to consider. And we applied this methodology to two different case studies based on 2030 scenarios for the European power system. We first considered one node per country, and called the zonal study, while the second uh, called nodal study represented some, some countries with more than one node. And specifically, France was split into 26 zones, two of which were further subdivided into 34 voltage nodes, uh, high voltage nodes. As mentioned earlier, the temporal scope of our simulations was limited to 24-hour periods. Uh, the type of analyses we carried out are similar to those that Sven showed us earlier. 
we looked at how flexibility solution dispatch differed between the day ahead and the intraday markets. Uh, the major contributors were, uh, were uh, gas generation and the adjustment of uh, interconnected power flows, which represented a very significant part of the difference between the uh, day ahead and intraday markets. This important role for interconnectors led to significant differences in the congestions observed in the day ahead and intraday markets. Uh, in this particular example, uh, out of uh, 1,700 um, cases of congestions on the different borders on our European system, 35% of cross-border congestions disappeared, while an extra 12% appeared and 10% of congestions ended up being anticipated in the opposite direction. As such, grid congestions and power flows will become harder to anticipate in the day ahead. As a result, TSO coordination around cross-border capacity will become critical and should be improved. This applies for both capacity calculation and capacity allocation, particularly on the intraday, but also for congestion management. The consideration of uncertainty in capacity calculation and allocation also appears to be critical. This points to a likely drawback of day ahead in oil markets with increasing renewable penetration the prices sent to the market participants could be more and more misleading. For long-term studies, these results also raised the question of how we should consider cross-border capacity calculation in our models and whether uncertainty should be included or not. We also looked at how profits generated by different technologies was shared between the day ahead and intraday markets. Here we consider profits as the difference between market price and marginal cost. So first looking at uh, flexible assets. Uh, here we have opened, open and closed circuit gas turbines, hydro, batteries, power to gas and pump storage. And it is worth noting that different technologies obtain different proportions of their profit on the day ahead and intraday markets, and some making all their profits on the latter. Also note here that these profits vary considerably, considerably within a single technology from one country to the next. Now, if we look at less flexible assets such as coal, lignite, nuclear, solar PV, run of river hydro and wind. Uh, for all these technologies, profits are far greater on the day ahead than on the, than on the intraday market. Wind and solar profits on the intraday market are essentially linked to changes in generation forecasts and can therefore take negative values. These results suggest that considering both markets, both the intraday and day ahead market, is necessary to ensure effective long term power system planning. An optimal investment plan obtained by a methodology assuming perfect foresight will miss effects associated with the need to manage lead time dependent uncertainty, leading to suboptimal solutions or even solutions that are unable to ensure security of supply. Further work is required to quantify the extent of this bias and to see how it is affected by the inclusion of additional flexibility solutions. Beyond theoretical centralized power system planning, Studies assessing the value of a specific technology should also account for these effects and not focus solely on spot market revenues. Many flexibility solutions will make most of their profit on the intraday market. That is to say, the value they will bring to the system will primarily reside in their ability to adjust their behavior close to real time to cope with system-wide uncertainty. On a similar note, the design of capacity mechanisms should account for all revenue streams, not only in the spot market or ancillary services, as can sometimes be the case currently. I'll now move over to the to NCL's part. Thank you, Thomas. I'm Giudita Pisano. I am um, uh, with the University of Cagliari in Italy, and uh, my research group contributed to the um, within the NCL consortium at the Osmos project. In W, uh, 
P2, we developed a procedure for modeling the flexibility of the distribution system. Next slide, please. Uh, we start uh, uh, from uh, the consideration that the flexibility is mainly found at the distribution level, uh, but the same products are needed for operating both the transmission and distribution systems. Uh, there are many open questions uh, about the flexibility used, potentially provided by the distributed energy resources connected at the medium uh, and even at the low voltage level networks. For, in, for instance, uh, to which system operator can the distributed energy resources connected to the distribution system provide their flexibility, distribution, uh, DSO, TSO or both? And um, I would like to point out that the exploitation of distributed uh, distribution flexibilities is uh, a new practice that needs to be uh, simulated via um, fair use cases or uh, uh, analyzing pilot projects. Within uh, the Osmos project and CL performed simulation of use cases uh, by exploiting an original, um, an original methodology that can answer several open questions regarding the flexibility uh, from the distribution system. Uh, next slide, please. The final goal, uh, goal uh, of uh, our methodology uh, is uh, to assess uh, to what extent the use of flexibility by the TSO can impact the DSO activities. We hypothesized local market models where DSO can exploit a quote of flexibility from the ERs to um, solve internal operational issues. And uh, we quantified the residual flexibility that can be offered to the TSO in the global ancillary service market by the same resources. Uh, such approach, such an approach uh, can be used uh, by all the stakeholders of the power system, like the ones la listed in the right uh, of uh, this slide, but, um, from different points of view. Uh, next slide, please. The proposed methodology um, consists of two main tasks. We firstly estimate the load and generation profiles at the TSO-DSO interfaces by using open data only and GIS application and tools, uh, starting from uh, various kinds of data. Um, the um, procedure performs a special classification for assigning to each territorial uh, portion a share of demand and production. Uh, the results uh, are the active and reactive power profile ex exchanged at uh, the TSO DSO interfaces? Uh, next slide, please. Then uh, our methodology is able to build a synthetic med network model for each real distribution network that mm, we want to study. And in the slide on the right, uh, it's uh, picturely represented uh, such a methodology. And uh, at the, the end of this task, the, uh, each uh, um, real TSO DSO interface is modeled by also by the synthetic network in terms of topology, conductors, etc. Um, and uh, in the slide, there is an example of the results of uh, an area in central France. Next slide, please. Uh, the last task assesses the flexibility capabilities of each uh, distribution network in terms of quantity and price pairs for each time interval distinguished between upward and downward bits. Uh, optimal power flow calculation are performed for identifying technical constraint violation. It uh, may happen that no violation are found and uh, thus the feasible flexibility is the same of uh, uh, the potential. Uh, otherwise, the violation can be solved by resorting to the reactive power support or in more critical uh, conditions, the feasible flexibility is definitely reduced compared with the potential. The final results are the price quantity course and the profile uh, of the feasible and feasible flexibility is in the slide. Next slide, please. Our studies uh, uh, dealt with uh, several challenges. The most important are related to the lack of distribution observability and uh, to the uncertainties typical of the distribution system studies. Nevertheless, our studies have many um, strengths. Only a few are summarized in this slide. We um, 
Uh, we all know that uh, the data on distribution system are not open, even uh, thought uh, known by the DSO, very salt on that topology uh, and the characteristic of a given network can be available for any studies outside the DSO departments. Our method is able to represent any distribution network with a realistic synthetic model that uh, takes into account the mm, territorial characteristic of the specific uh, uh, place. And uh, such a model can be used for any study. Uh, another strand is related to the technical constraint compliance. Uh, um, uh, let me say that uh, with the opening of uh, the ancillary service market, uh, uh, even the smallest uh, DR can participate in the power system operation. This means that uh, the uh, DR owners uh, may offer a reduction or increase of their production or consumption disregarding the effect of such variation on the distribution network operation. And um, in case of overcoming the technical constraints, such offers should be blocked by the DSO and do force the DSO to reconsider its dispatching plan. And in this case, the TSO-DSO interaction would be more complicated. By assessing the residual flexibility, the, uh, the offers from the ARS uh, will be only the feasible ones. In other words, our methodology makes a sort of prequalification of uh, distributed resources that can offer flexibility in a coordinated market environment. Next slide, please. Now only uh, a taste of the results of our studies. Uh, in this slide, the results of the entire selected uh, region in central France. Two scenarios were simulated, one uh, with the, the DR spread along the distribution network according to the fit and forget uh, uh, approach, and uh, one more critical with big sites resources concentrated in a few nodes of the network. In the critical scenario, the reduction of the theoretical market potential is as expected, more significant than uh, in the fit uh, forget scenario. And uh, these results demonstrated that the grid li limitation in, of the distribution network cannot be disregarded. Next slide, please. The same consideration can be made regarding the results of a single HHV node that combines several distribution networks. By this result, it is worth noticing that uh, the spatial downscaling reveals uh, uh, local criticalities and the reduction of the, the potential is greater than the uh, entire region. Next slide, please. Finally, um, SK messages or remarks of our study, I can say that the flexibility extent exploitable by the TSO must be careful assessed, uh, carefully assessed. Uh, the impact depends on the number of the DRs participating in the market and also on, on the position of the resources in the network. Uh, tools like the one that we proposed able to estimate the impact of the provision of some flexibility products from DRs uh, on the grid limitation may be very useful for avoiding uh, extra cost. And the last remark is relevant to the coordination of network operators that both need the flexibility uh, services. Assessing the, uh, the possible impact on the distribution network can prevent blocks by the DSO and can simplify the use of flexibility by the DSO. Thank you for your attention. All right, uh, so now it's my part. Um, hey everyone, my name is Florian and uh, like Sven, I work at UDE. Um, I was part of the team that took care of the nodal market um, runs that were uh, part of WP2. And we basically had two main uh, objectives. One was uh, taking the joint market model that uh, Sven presented results from and basically nodalize it. And uh, the second one was take the input uh, given from WP1 which was presented yesterday, and also nodalize this input as it was not given on a nodal level. And um, yeah, I want to take the next few slides to present you uh, what you can see now, the methodology, and then later on, that's no, fine, Thomas. Um, we're going to look at some results. Um, what you can see on the right-hand side here is Central Western Europe, which is the market area for our nodal market design run. 
but I want to um, use only Belgium to explain you how we um, distributed the renewable energy sources on a nodal level. And uh, first, you need to understand kind of a bottom-up approach. If you look at Belgium and the shapes that are restricted by white lines, those are the nuts free regions in Belgium. And what we did, for example, with wind uh, power is that we took the existing an existing database of wind farms that are there today and uh, compared them compared them to the desired capacity given by WP1. So uh, we knew that we need to build up capacity, obviously, if we go 10 years uh, in the future, or eight rather. And uh, what we did then is that we ran repeatedly a discrete choice model that builds up uh, wind farms uh, uh, under the given geoscope. And as an intermediate result, we then had the uh, capacity, like we did this until we met the capacity given from WP1. So we then had, for example, for Belgium, um, the, uh, no, uh, the local distribution of uh, wind farms <coughs> for 2030. And in the next step, we ran a weather year. So we went from capacity to generation. And what we then had was um, we had uh, nuts free uh, granularity for renewable generation this uh, example wind and but we still needed to assign those to the nodes that we uh, have in our model and therefore we need to look at the different uh, uh, at the other shapes that are restricted by the blue lines uh, each and every shape has one center point and this center point is actually a node that we have coordinates for in our grid model and those shapes aren't arbitrarily they are Voronoi shapes and they have kind of the unique characteristics so to say that every point within a sh within this shape is closer to its center point, so the node, as it is to every other center point. And our thought process was that uh, if you look at any uh, Voronoi region, that everything that is covered by that uh, Voronoi region should be assigned to the nodal infeed time series at this uh, at its center node. And obviously, the Voronoi regions, uh, Voronoi regions sometimes split the nuts regions. And uh, therefore, we distributed this. Um, let's say if two Voronoi regions exactly split uh, nuts two and nuts three region in half, everyone gets 50% of the um, infeed for this specific nuts three region. And we obviously also did this for PV, and uh, the Voronoi uh, shapes were also the basis for our load distribution. And on the next slide, you can now see how this turns out on the um, on our geoscope. First, I want to focus on the right-hand side. Um, we see different sized cakes that represent the generation at, on a nodal level. Obviously, this is not all uh, model in-feed, but also model output, because, um, for example, if we look at the red cakes in France, um, those are representing nuclear uh, power generation, and this is optimized in our model. However, the wind in-feed is an input. And as you can see, our methodology leads to the following distribution that if we look at France, for example, we see that the cakes are mostly blue, the renewable cakes, so to say, in the north. And if we look at the area of the Côte d'Azur in the south of France, um, they get more and more uh, yellow. So there's a lot more solar um, power uh, generated proportionally, obviously. Um, and in the north, and we can see the same basically for Germany, like very large cakes uh, because the offshore wind parks and a lot of onshore wind in the north. And the cakes get smaller going uh, further south and uh, the relative share of solar increases. And on the left hand side, you can see the result of our load, no, load distribution. Sorry. Um, what I, I just uh, teased, we also used the Voronoi shapes. However, we uh, said that within a region, the population density and the local GDP are responsible for how much load is actually distributed uh, or assigned to one specific node. And uh, yeah, with the methodology turned out like this. Uh, if we look at France, obviously there's a lot of um, electricity um, demanded in, uh, in and around Paris or uh, for the German market area. Uh, sorry that I can't use my mouse right now. <laughs> there are also in the very highly populated um, areas, the most uh, uh, load is um, demanded. Um, all right, so far, uh, so much um, for the model inputs. Now the next slide covers the results that we received after we ran our um, model year 2030. On the left hand side, I plotted the average day ahead price. Sorry, I hope you can hear me. Teams is saying something. Uh, 
Um, yeah, anyway, on the left hand side, you see the average day ahead price. And uh, green uh, nodes indicate a relatively lower price and yellow and red ones higher prices. So what we can see here basically is um, we modeled a switch from zonal to nodal market design uh, like this uh, immediately. And uh, on average over the year, we can still see the uh, today's price zones reflect uh, kind of um, the price zones in our nodal uh, model. Right? So for example, nearly the whole area of France is uh, paint is colored in green, uh, giving away a very similar average they had price um, for those uh, for this country. And what we derive from this is that the international transmission capacities must be pretty scarce in our model, and this uh, then triggers those uh, the price zones we see. Um, on the right hand side, we see kind of a KPI from the from our nodal market approach, and it is the average daily price spread for every node. We compute this, that we look for every day the maximum and the minimum price, compute the delta. We then have 365 deltas for every node, and then obviously use the average. And uh, the color scheme is the same, so green is lower volatility, and uh, orange and red are higher volatility. And uh, we can see here two very um, interesting things. One is, again, if we look at the French market zone, with a pretty uh, homogeneous price uh, pattern on the left-hand side, the daily volatility, so to say, is pretty heterogeneous. Yeah, so we can have a node with this, with the same average day ahead price, however, with a very different volatility pattern, and uh, we use this as kind of a predictor for the the value of flexibility. Right, so the higher the volatility is uh, on a on a daily basis, the more demand for flexibility options might be at a certain node, and. Um, we can also see another interesting uh, pattern on this. Uh, if we look at the German and Austrian market area, we see on the left hand side similar prices among those two countries. However, the volatility distribution is pretty different, which is probably due to the different uh, generation parks um, of the respective countries. And um, as a last uh, thing, what we did, um, I just want to explain before I show you the next slide, is um, we now had this price time series for every node. And then we thought we would uh, we run a, a storage uh, um, optimization model that lets an storage optimize it, uh, itself on every node uh, towards a contribution margin or profit maximization, however you put it, and then um, and then visualize this and uh, and see maybe uh, further results. And I, I plotted this aggregated on the next slide, which is the box plot of contribution margins of those storage systems, as you can see in the title. Um, uh, on the description, it is a uh, storage with an E2P ratio of one. So it can pretty good or pretty well exploit uh, the, times, uh, the time series. And if we, let's say, compare the countries I focused uh, on the last slide, Germany and Austria, we can, uh, we can see in the German box, for example, that the median is pretty high, indicating a high value of flexibility, so to say. And uh, Austria, uh, comparatively, has a lower medium, and the box is located further um, uh, towards the x-axis, um, meaning that the value of uh, flexibility is a little lower in this country, which makes sense if we look at the daily price pattern uh, that is exploited by the storage unit. And uh, yeah, there was a lot of information. If you have any further questions, I think we can push them back to the Q&A session. But, um, that's basically uh, what I wanted to explain to you today. And now I think it's Thomas's turn again, right? Thanks a lot, Florian. Um, I'll just wrap up very quickly. Uh, two key takeaways from our uh, work package. Uh, first of all, the forecast errors uh, lead to significant dispatch differences between the day ahead and intraday market outcomes. And accounting for these differences is likely to have an impact on optimal investment strategies. There are still many modeling challenges to be tackled to perform European scale zonal and nodal market simulations, but these simulations are crucial to providing quantified evidence and market design recommendations. If you wish to learn more about our work, uh, you can go and have a look at the different deliverables uh, we published and the different publications. 
Um, if you have any specific questions, uh, you can either ask them now during the Q&A session or here, here are our contact details and the OSMO's uh, website address. So you can go and find the deliverables. But for your attention, feel free to fire your questions about. Um, I'll, I'll take uh, the first question from uh, Hugo. Well, Florian went to uh, went into detail about how they uh, built their nodal regions in a uh, so new DE study. In RTE study, uh, we used um, well. There were, as you, as I mentioned, there's two different levels of a uh, subdivision. So the first one, uh, zone where France is split into different zones, this is based on uh, structural congestions. We basically reused the zones that we already already use in our uh, network development plans. And uh, then when we went down to a nodal level, we take high uh, high voltage uh, nodes. So that's just basically the uh, ne network uh, parameters as they are. Are there any other questions? OK, I guess we must have been particularly clear then. Um, so as I mentioned, if you do have questions later on, here are our email addresses if you want to contact us directly. And uh, I think uh, this session has been recorded and should be sent to you later on, if I'm not mistaken. Actually, yeah, everything will be posted on Autonomous websites. And in the coming weeks, an email will be sent to all the participants with uh, the link towards the final material. OK, well, if there are no further questions, well, thanks a lot for attending. I hope you found it interesting and I wish you a nice day. <laughs>